Since the rise of the internet, there's been countless people that have stood out from the crowd to make a name for themselves in one way or another. Sometimes it's through their accomplishments or contributions, sometimes the interest around them stems from their controversial personality or actions, and then sometimes it's both. Today we're going to be talking about the origins of Derek Smart, the desktop commander, one of the most controversial people to ever fire up a dial-up connection. Independent game developer by day, god-tier shitposter by night. If I'm online shit posting, that's my time. They're not paying me for my time. Nobody can pay me a thousand bucks an hour for my time. Okay? So if I want to spend, if, if I'm in the middle of compiled links or whatever, or writing design or doing stuff in something that's time consuming, what am I supposed to be doing? Jerking off? He's the destroyer of Coke machines and any Star Citizen fanboy's worst enemy. I'm going to say this again. I say this on every stream I go. I have absolutely no doubt in my mind that this project is on the brink of collapse. There, I, 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 I'm not going to say anything more than that. All accurate depictions of Commander Smart, but they ultimately fail to truly describe him in his entirety. In the wonderful world of indie game development, Derek is known as somewhat of a myth or an urban legend. There's whispers of his 30 year history all across the internet. We've talked about the crazy world of PC game development before with Cleveland Blakemore. Now, if Cleve is considered an ancient artifact of early PC gaming history, then Dr. Smart is the holy grail. You may notice there are some similarities between the two game devs. Both have controversial backgrounds in game development, both have eccentric online personalities, but most importantly, both have the uncanny ability to start raging flame wars at the press of a button. But they differ in one key aspect, their scale. Cleveland was focused, centered, he had a mission. It was all about grimoire. See, there were a few crazy trans cats and penisauruses, maybe a few runaway teens along the way, but Cleveland was determined and he had one mission, his game. The rest was just noise. Derek, on the other hand, is a much more complicated person. He isn't known for one singular event, and he's had one of the longest online histories you'll ever see. He has cemented himself as a pivotal part of online internet lore. Some people may know him from his legendary flame wars in the 90s or his countless online feuds and lawsuits with publishers. Others may know him for more recent events surrounding him, like his battle with Chris Roberts and the Star Citizen fanbase. Citizens is a term us goons came up with to describe a specific Star Citizen backer. It's the backers who spend their time on a war of attrition and attacking dissent across the internet. Those are citizens. Either way, they both share a common theme that's plagued Derek over the years, and that's his uncanny ability to stir up controversy. So who exactly is Derek Smart? Well, in the simplest terms, he's an OG indie game developer whose online interactions have massively overshadowed his professional body of work. Derek's a real enigma in the game industry, because none of his games have ever actually reached the level of notoriety that he himself has from simply defending them. The best defense is a crippling definitive and unceremoniously cruel offense. After all I am under military command, and I don't plan on running for diplomatic office. I'm sure there are actually people out there who have gotten more enjoyment from reading Derek's posts than actually playing his games. Over the years, Mr. Smart has developed a certain reputation. He has become known for appearing out of nowhere whenever he's criticized and utterly laying waste to any and all opposition in a frenzy of over-the-top posts and insults, i.e. flaming. Gasoline takes too long to burn and would require more than one post to be truly effective. A tactical nuke takes one post. A good TN post means that you don't even have to come back and explain anything nor respond further. It's my version of a drive-by flaming. One in which everyone, I do mean everyone, gets the collective asses singed. No person or website is safe when they badmouth the Supreme Commander. The legend goes, all you have to do is say his name, then bam, he appears and digitally sets fire to everything in sight. How would I phrase this? You're well known for being the Bloody Mary of the internet, of That's forums. That's a good way of putting it. <laughs> okay. Um, we all know Bloody Mary, you know, you say her name three times in front of a mirror and Bloody Mary shows up. Well, you say Derek Smart in a forum and you only have to say it once and he shows up. <laughs> and does, does the term tactical nuke mean anything? <laughs> well, you know, you've been around since the early days, so if, of course you probably know how that whole urban legend started. It's because back in the day, we only had a few places to be. Yeah. It was either CompuServe, AOL, Kix, Bix, or one of those fringe ones. That was actually, there was only like five of them. So there really 
weren't that many forums. I, we, didn't, I, we didn't have web pages with comment sections and all this stuff. So, so if I'm gonna be on, on CompuServe and shit talking or something's going on over there, and you know, I do my, we all do that even now and even today, you know, you, you, you do your pass, you go to the forum, you, you post like for now, I, you know, I check something awful, I check Twitter, I check Facebook. I do it during certain times of the day in between compiles and links and design and all the other shit that I do during the day. But back in the day, it's the same thing. You go to Kicks, you go to AOL, you go to you go to Bix, you go to all these places. So if I go in there and someone and I'll, I'll use that, if I go in there and there's somebody talking about me, naturally, when I do my past, I'm all in. So the the, the whole urban legend, then websites like the Adrenaline Vault and Gone Gold, all those other uh, websites started popping up, they started getting forums, and the whole thing kind of turned into this huge thing where as soon as you mention Derek is gonna show up, people don't realize that it's because I do my my social, well, back in the day we didn't call it social media, no. I did my forum pass at certain times of the day. It just so happens that if there's somebody's talking about me, I engage. Because I've always, you know, I'm not, I've, a lot of people know me, I'm not one of those uh, uh, gaming game developer executives who, who only talk through a mouthpiece or through PR. I engage with everybody, so that's the reason why it's 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 got its upsides and its downsides. For me, it's always the upside because the key to my quote unquote success is that I connect with gamers at a personal level. You cuss me, I'm gonna cuss you. You bring a knife to a bit to 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 you bring a knife to a gunfight, I'm bringing a flamethrower because I'm just me. It's really hard to put into words the reputation he's built for himself over the years. Outrageous, dramatic, relentless, hilarious, all would be appropriate descriptions of Derek's online posting habits and personality. It is important to note though, that Derek has come to terms with a lot of his past. He does try to downplay a lot of his actions and shift the narrative a bit, but deep down he's just as fierce. You'll notice there are facets of his personality that stay the same over the years. He's always combative, he's always exaggerated, and he's always been extremely defensive, but he has matured. 2019 Derek is a much more calmer, collected commander, but just as controversial. Now he tends to pick and choose his battles unlike the early days. The early days. So I guess that's where we probably should start. Derek's early days. The origins of Commander Smart are wrapped in mystery. The legend tells of a great man destined to rise from the ashes of a destroyed coke machine and save PC gaming from a lifetime of shitty space games with an iron fist. A monumental task. Okay, satire aside, from what I read about Derek Smart, he seemed to have a pretty normal early life. Derek grew up as a nerdy kid who was always interested in art, space, and science fiction. Star Wars and Star Trek were a huge inspiration for that generation. As a teen, he worked at a gas station, and in a Kotaku article, he claims that after a physical altercation with his boss's son, he developed a defensive nature when facing opposition, something Derek has been known for to have even to this day. If he's pushed in a corner, two things are a guarantee. He's going to push back and he's never going to forget about it. Nobody that I know of, that I know I can reach out and touch, gets to do something to me and I let it go. I let very little things go. In the late 80s, game development wasn't really something Derek was interested in initially. He didn't become interested in video games until his late teens and because the industry wasn't very lucrative at the time, he ended up pursuing a job in the IT field. That quickly changed though when he was introduced to a video game called Jet Fighter. That really appealed to Derek. There's two general assumptions on what made Dr. Smart shift his focus into game development. One was that he started working on his own game in 88 and just decided to go with it because he fell in love with gaming and saw an opportunity. The other opinion is that Derek was more motivated by the success Chris Roberts was having as a game developer. I'll be talking more in depthly about Chris in part 2. He's got a much bigger part to play in Derek's later years, but it's important to know that these two guys go way back. There's even rumors that when Wing Commander was released, Derek was threatening to sue Chris for releasing a similar product that he was working on. Derek claims it just lies from his past, but it's clear that there was a bit of a rivalry back then. Before Star Citizen, do you have any involvement with Chris uh, Chris Roberts? Like, is there any history between you two? Like, I, I gotta ask. Here's the thing. No, it's all false. Okay, the whole urban, I'll tell you exactly what happened. The whole urban legend thing goes back to the Wing Commander days. Because yes, I, still, I remember Wing Commander. Yeah, uh, it goes back to the Wing Commander days because I was still working in Battlecruiser at the time. Wing Commander had the backing of, you know, a huge publisher. I didn't, I had the backing of, actually, yeah, I had the backing of, 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 a, of a small publisher. So it's not unlike the trash talking we do right now. Oh, there's some guy called, Wing, you know, uh, Chris Roberts doing Wing Commander. They've got this feature, they've got this feature. 
feature. It's all trash talk. So you've never met Chris Roberts? No! We've never been in the same room. I mean, I've met him. We've been, we've been at E3, I've seen him across the room. I've been in E3. E3 book. Actually, now that I remember, when I first saw Wing Commander, was at a closed showing, and he wasn't even there. Okay? So we don't have this quote-unquote history where we're, we're rivals. The only rivalry we have, if you want to call it that, is that we both develop space games. And he went on to have to have a huge success with his, and I had middling success with mine. And that's pretty much how it goes. So all this nonsense about, you know, me writing them nasty letters, you know, about lawsuits, this is completely false. And there's nobody on this planet Earth who could actually say, here's the proof, here's what he did. And that's the reason why when Eric Peterson, who also got third party information from Chris, when he tweeted that and put it, you know, on the RSI website, I told him, if you don't send me proof within 24 hours, you're going to hear from my attorney because this is false. And I'm telling you it's false. And I know it's false because you weren't there. And the reason you weren't there is because it never happened. Either way, it's safe to say that Chris Roberts and his success as a developer was a huge motivating factor for Derek to jump into game development. And with his lofty dreams and overconfidence, Derek eventually settled on the concept of his video game, Battle Cruiser, or the game, as he likes to call it. He drew his own concept art, he wrote a whole backstory with characters and back lore. He did struggle to find a developer in the beginning, but by 1992, after a couple years of brainstorming, things started to really pay off. He had formed his own company, 3000 AD, and eventually was able to drum up some hype and interest. He got featured in a magazine called Computer Game Strategy Plus, which was a pretty big break. It caught the attention of his first serious publisher. Derek's game was still in its infancy at this time, but now that interest was building, he had a reason to really take things serious. But unfortunately, it just wasn't meant to be. They brought Derek and his game to a CES trade show at the end of the year, and after some negative feedback from people at the trade show, they ended up cancelling his contract at the expo. The real kicker here is the negative feedback. They claim that Derek's game wasn't really up to the standards currently set by other games in the genre, mainly Chris Roberts and his new versions of Wing Commander. Once again, in a sense, Roberts beat him to the punch. But the thing you'll come to learn about Derek is he's determined. The next couple years was a combination of battle cruiser moving from publisher to publisher. As Derek fell into the cycle of upgrading and refining, he likes to refer to it as chasing technology. This is actually a common problem that affects basically anyone in computer engineering or program development. Technology often advances quicker than people are able to fully utilize it. During this time, Derek was keeping the hype train going by advertising his game on different web forums. He often compared Battle Cruiser to Wing Commander, but often claimed it was going to be bigger and better in every single way. In 1995, Derek finally settled with a publisher, Take-Two Interactive, seven years after he claims he first came up with the idea. On the surface, it seemed like everything was going according to plan. But in reality, this is when shit would slowly start hitting the fan one turd at a time. So for some context, this period of time in the lore of Derekology was the start which set the foundation for his reputation he currently has. This was the start of the Great Flame War of 99, or often referred to as the Flame War Follies. This was a massive online shitstorm which actually started in the mid 90s and lasted years. It centered around the aftermath from the Battlecruiser 3000 AD release and Derek's extremely combative nature online. Some people actually consider this to be the longest online flame war to date, and a lot of crazy shit would actually stem from it. I'll be honest with you, this is old internet lore, like way before my time. I was around 10 years old when this Usenet trash fire was raging, so it's hard for me to really put into words how monumental it was, because frankly I wasn't really there to witness it. But from hearing the way the old fags out there reminisce about it, and the fact that it stayed with Derek for so long, really makes me think it was a sight to behold. But, I, just as a side note, you know, everybody goes on about trolls these days. They don't remember the Flame Wars, do they? <laughs> no, they do not. <laughs> no, they do not. Several years, over 60,000 posts. But I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. See, once the internet started to become more accessible in the mid-90s, it became a great place to create excitement and hype for a product. It was a brand new media for advertisement. And it was more common to see game developers engage with posters and potential buyers on an individual basis, far from the norm it is today. And Derek took full advantage of that new medium. He used different web forums and chat groups to hype Battlecruiser, AOL, Compuverse, and Usenet to name a few. Derek was also known for spamming and making some radical claims. Some were in regards to Battlecruiser's programming, which he claimed was an advanced neural net AI he solely created. He may have also took a little bit of heat from his box cover. Sign me up! But other than that, he wasn't hated or disliked at first. 
A lot of people were actually supportive towards Battlecruiser in the beginning. When Derek signed up with Take 2 to publish Battlecruiser in 95, the hype really started picking up speed because now it was becoming a reality. And as more people became interested in the inevitable release, the more cocky Derek's claims became. He was marking Battlecruiser as the game changer. Not just the game for people interested in space combat, but everything any PC gamer could really want. Jet fighting, space simulation, all controlled by advanced AI. The real kicker though, was that Derek claimed that the game was basically complete, and all Take-Two had to do was refine the code and do any last minute tweaking that might be needed. So the publisher set a date for January of 1996, and as that deadline drew near, Derek's posting became more frequent. And it started to become clear that there were some troubles behind the scene. And to add on to that, his short temper and cocky attitude were also starting to draw in online detractors who kind of liked to push his buttons. Derek would sign off his posts by ending with Derek Smart, PhD. This started to become a huge focal point with his detractors. Another was his professionalism credentials. Derek didn't really like to admit it at the time, but from my understanding, he's a self-taught video game coder and programmer. Which there's nothing wrong with, it's actually kind of impressive, but it doesn't bode well when you're trying to sell a product as extensive as he was back then. This is around the time Derek's posts also moved to Usenet, and his posting habits really started to take hold. It's hard to say what exactly was going on between him and Take Two, but it's clear that there was a massive disconnect because the game that Derek was making was far from what was advertised. And even after Take Two dumped a massive amount of money into it, Battlecruiser still needed a lot of work, time, and resources. Luckily, he got them to push back the release date till May, but it was too little too late and a lot of people that once supported him were starting to turn on him in doubt. Take Two was also putting the responsibility on him. Derek did claim it was a near finished product when they acquired it in 1995. They bought into the hype machine and they wanted to release it, but it wasn't close to ready and Take Two started to consider just cutting its losses. To add on to the issues, the May release date was also missed. And this just added fuel to the online fire of angry gamers and dark detractors, which were growing by the day. Feeling the stress from Take Two in the online community, Smart said fuck it and signed a contract with Take Two, giving them control over the project. And they once again pushed the release date to October of that year to capitalize off of the holiday season. So there's somewhat conflicting stories on just what went down between Derek and the Take Two headquarters. The general consensus is that Derek tried to borderline sabotage the release of his game once Take Two took it over. Leading up to the release, he fought them on every decision, he became damn near impossible to work with, and he may have purposely left bugs in the final product. I think part of Derek knew it wasn't close to what he promised and he wanted more time to work on it. I don't think he expected Take Two to just go ahead, say fuck it, take a massive hit and release the unfinished game, which they ultimately did. The legend goes that they did it behind the commander's back, and when he found out that they were going to release regardless of how he felt, it pushed Derek into a rage-filled frenzy, and he had a 1v1 with an innocent Coca-Cola machine in the lobby, utterly trashing it. He may or may not have been escorted off the property. Now, in full disclosure, I don't know if this actually happened or not, but it's a huge part of Derek's lore. Huge! And it was often used to bait him into altercations online in the olden days. I can't say 100% or not if he actually trashed a coke machine though. Or if this is just some kind of weird meme that's stuck with him over the years to represent how angry and dramatic he is. Derek does address it online, but he kind of brushes it off. He claimed in a guest editorial that a week before they released the game, he brought to Take Two's attention that the two game engines they were using were causing major conflicts with each other, which caused the game to run in single digit frame rates. Once that happened, the director at Take Two flipped his shit and told Derek to leave the building or he's going to call the cops on him. Derek calmly left, and then someone informed the media that during the incident he attacked a coke machine on the way out. But he also claims on his personal blog that the legend originated from trolls and Take Two CEO feeding CGW magazine false vax in an attempt to slander him. So I don't really know. The coke machine thing never happened. Let's move on. All I can say is usually something like this that's so strongly associated with someone has to have some kind of truth to it. Either way, it was the least of his worries. Because once the game was released, it was complete junk as expected. A large majority of the gamers couldn't even get it to install. Ones that did were met with an overall complicated, confusing, and buggy game. And Derek was quickly thrown under the bus by Take Two. Everyone blamed him, and he went into full defensive mode, lashing out at anyone and everyone. Derek's small group of detractors quickly blossomed into a full-grown internet mob. They ridiculed him online, they baited him into altercations, they called him out on his PhD. The attention also brought in a lot of other bystanders or casual trolls who just decided to throw gas on the fire and entice Derek into some more radical posting. 
One person made a thread called Derek Buttfuck Sheep. That caught a lot of attention. Some of them made threads to complain about his manual, ask him stupid questions just to waste his time. Some just trolled him. As he retaliated, people pushed hard and started to save his posts and follow him from website to website. This was a monumental time in Derekology. Because not only was it a huge screw up on a business level from Take Two, but it's also when Derek would ascend to the status of God tier shit poster he is today. He was always known for being dramatic and cocky online, but now it was personal. Now it was war. Take Two let all the blame fall on him. The internet wanted blood, and no matter what he said, people were ridiculing him online. The flame war was officially on, and Derek was not backing down. First, he decided to get his game back. He put on his big boy pants and he sued Take Two for the rights to the Battle Cruiser and breach of contract. Funny part is, he actually ended up settling out of court in 1998. Derek got the win and he got his rights back to his game, and he even got some cash, I believe. At this time, he could have just washed his hands at game development and went back to the IT field. He had a chance to walk away from everything, but he decided to stick it out. He tried to do some damage control in Selvage's name, so he took his cash and he went back to work on Battle Cruiser. After a series of updates, he eventually got the game to a playable point, and Derek himself sunk money into it so that he could finish it and give people the game that he was promising. Well, kind of. Even when it hit a state where people would consider it complete, it still was nowhere near the game that was envisioned. And he was aware of that. In a surprising turn of events, he decided to give the game away for free. But at this point, it didn't matter how much better it was. His name was still tainted and the internet was still ridiculing him. Once again, he was that nerdy kid getting picked on pushed in a corner, except this time, instead of just taking the L, he took the battle to the internet, keyboard warrior style. As the great flame war raged on after the release of Battlecruiser and its updates, any post or website mentioning Derricker's game was ruthlessly attacked by him. On Usenet alone, there were over 60,000 posts of utter spurgatory related to Battlecruiser and Derrick. He was a man scorned and anyone and everything was fair game. The only way to stop him was to ban him or close the threads. Some highlights of this period of time were people demanding a real manual and updates so they could actually play the game. There was also Derek yelling at Asian people. Again, let me apologize to all Orientals who were offended by my post. The rest of you can kiss my ass if you think I'm racist. There was Derek threatening magazine editors with lawsuits. Derek claiming he's a Mensa member. Derek claiming Take Two didn't pay him. And his most infamous post ever, his piss and mouth flame. A demo of Battle Cruiser is on the September issue of PC Games. Yawn. Unzips pants. Pees in Jim's mouth. Closes pants. Jim swallows. Jim shuts up. Mission accomplished. Now this is my kind of game development. As 1998 starts to come to a close and the flame war momentarily slows down as a result of bans and general annoyance, a small section of hardcore Derek detractors starts to form to keep the flames going. They were referred to as the Flame War Folliists. Some are just people who don't like Derek. Some are people who have interacted with him in the past and think he's insane. Some are just casual trolls who see the potential entertainment in making him freak out. Others want to call him out on his lies he may have said before. One of the main detractors was a man named Bill Huffman, the godfather of Derekology. He was the owner of many websites that contained a lot of Derek posts and satirical information that people have archived over this time. Werewolves.org was one of the more noteworthy ones. Unfortunately, it's gone now, so don't go look for it. Huffman managed to get Derek pretty riled up. One of the main points of contention was in regards to Derek's PhD. Huffman was dead set it was fake or from a PhD mill, started calling Derek out for it online. This just kept the flame war going. For a couple of years, these guys were at each other's throats online. Huffman and the Folius were trolling Derek everywhere. Derek was flaming the hell out of people in return. It must have been good times. Eventually, it got to the point where Derek brought up the big guns once again. He was threatening to get a lawyer into the fray, and both parties were actually entertaining the idea of suing each other. Derek was going to sue Huffman for harassment, and Huffman was going to sue Derek for taking down his websites. It's hard to say exactly how bad Derek was getting it online during the flame war without actually being there, but eventually it started to take its toll and it kept snowballing. The next couple of years after the Battlecruiser fiasco saw Derek dive back to the drawing board while simultaneously battling it out with detractors online. He still had things he wanted to accomplish in gaming, so he went back to work on his next chapter of his game. Universal Combat The Universal Combat art can be summed up with one simple saying. Those who do not learn from their past are doomed to repeat it. At this time in Derek Sega, his online reputation has basically been established. And even though the great Usenet flame war was behind him, he was still a topic of interest. You can actually look at Derek's flame war like a forest fire. It rages, it moves, and just when you think it's out, it jumps the fucking highway and burns your house down. 
Instead of being isolated on Usenet and other small forums, it was now a topic on various websites. Derek had become a modern day locale by this time. One of the first, in fact. He very quickly became notorious for appearing out of nowhere once his name was mentioned, and then dropping some dramatic lengthy dialogue about how great he was, and how everyone else was basically nothing but peasants. The fact of the matter is, most of you are just jealous, pure and simple. In the past when I would sink down to your levels, engage you in the pit, return insult for insult etc. Some of you got this false impression that we were of the same caliber, let alone the same caste. I make no excuses for who I am or what I am. What I do know, and that which is proven and consistent, is that I have progressed over the years, improved on that which I created etc. While, well, all of you are just the same crochety, stagnant, inconsequential people you always were. He calls it the smart bomb. He shows up, makes one post, and leaves the whole forum in a frenzy, often completely derailing any relevant conversation on there. Some websites blocked him as soon as he posted, just to prevent any threads from becoming future flame wars. Derek himself admits he did have some fun with it from time to time. He's totally not a troll though, guys. Behind the scenes though, his detractors and flame war folliists were as fierce as ever. They would archive his posts, follow him from website to website to entice a fight. It got so ridiculous that Derek was resorting to painting them as racist KKK members. He may have photoshopped some emails, I don't know, I wasn't there. Either way, just as quick as the Take 2 suit ended in 1998, the feud with his detractors was escalating and dragging him back into lull suit territory once again by the early 2000s. The straw that broke the back between Derek and his detractors was when a random kid who was familiar with both Bill Huffman and Derek's flame war got involved. The kid spotted Derek in real life and decided to post about it, describing his clothing and his vehicle. Huffman insinuated that the kid should have asked him about his PhD, and to everyone's surprise, the kid actually went back to the commander's house, causing him to flip his shit. I want to teach Huffman a lesson, and nothing is going to stop me from doing it. I'm only interested in destroying him. Period. This resulted in Derek calling the police and pressing harassment charges on Huffman because the kid himself was a minor. In the end, I believe they settled out of court in 2004 and Huffman took his sights down and him and Derek just kind of went their separate ways. I could be wrong, the details are kind of sparse for this event. Truth be told, this was just one of the many battles though that Derek waged during this time. He's a stubborn and determined man and he was far from finished in the world of gaming and lawsuits. To give you an idea of the dynamic during this time, I'd like to point out to a hilarious article written by Lotex on the Something Awful website. They made a satirical review of Derek's game. This short exchange sums up the events nicely. Universal Combat is one of the first games produced solely for sex offenders. For years these folks have been lobbying Congress and other white people who seemed old and important for a game that would make registered sex offenders feel good about the wretched lives they lead. Dr. Derek Smart who received a doctorate degree in being Derek Smart, heard their cries and spent the last 27 years of his life creating what he felt was an answer to this terrible dilemma. Universal Combat is the culmination of all his work and efforts, and is a truly amazing product when you consider the fact that Dr. Smart did not actually write a single line of code for it himself instead copying and pasting free JavaScript samples from tripod websites across the internet. Unfortunately, such a complex and revolutionary product is tainted by a few omissions and errors, which I will cover in this review. Look, I know some of you think you're above the law because you are on the net, but I never have and never will take legal action against anyone in the media. But if you bastards make me set an example, it won't be a good one. And trust me, I don't think any of you have enough pennies to rub together to outspend me. So whatever you do, don't test my resolve. I'm not taking this shit anymore. Dear Dr. Smart, as per your request, I have changed the offending remark. When he was convicted of bank fraud in 1994, has been altered to when he was convicted of bank fraud and raping an entire petting zoo in 1994. I hope this is satisfactory. On the business end of things, the production of Universal Combat went somewhat smoother than the first iteration. Derek found a new publisher for his game, the project became more focused on combat and progress was looking good at first. But the world of game development is rife with obstacles. Derek once again butted heads with his publisher as they pressed for releases. First, there were delays. Universal Combat missed its first release date in late 2003. And fearing a similar situation that Take Two went through, Dreamcatcher Interactive, the publisher behind Universal Combat, pushed and released Derek's game in early 2004 at his objection, just like what happened with Battlecruiser and Take Two. Dreamcatcher was also going to cut the price in half without consulting Derek, which caused him to lose his shit even more. 
Fearing another Battlecruiser fiasco, he ended up sending them a cease and desist in an attempt to hold off the release. During the hearing, Dreamcatcher claimed the Universal Combat didn't really warrant $40 price tag that they agreed upon, and the judge ruled against Derek and allowed them to release the game. All this did was make Derek's resolve even stronger. He doubled down and sued Dreamcatcher for damages and loss of revenue. This one didn't make it all the way through the courts because once again, both parties ended up settling their dispute privately out of court. Derek's got some pretty decent lawyers. Does that count as a win if you get a settle? I think so. While simultaneously working on Universal Combat updates, in July of 2004, Derek would also spark a mild controversy when he entertained the idea of bidding on the Free Space IP to produce Free Space 3. There was a lot of backlash from the fanbase, but in typical fashion, they were met with a smart bomb. Derek threatened that when he got the IP, he was going to sue the developers and terminate any community projects out of spite. When asked about this later on, he says he kind of looked at it as an opportunity to boost his reputation for future endeavors. I wanted to get the right because I love that game so much and I was very upset that, you know, Volition went their own way, you know, the kind of the franchise kind of died. You know, it's no different from, you know, all the resurgence right now of space games, you know. So I thought, you know what, I'm in between projects. I was sitting there thinking, you know, what am I going to do next? I'm thinking, oh, another Battle Cruiser game. Oh, another Universal Combat game. I'm like, no, you know, let's do something. You know, I figured, you know, if I went, to be honest with you, I had the most selfish ulterior motives imaginable. I figured, you know what? Okay, these bastards have been bitching at me for the longest time. And I know most of them like Free Space. Now, maybe if I went and got the Free Space title and, you know, I did a Free Space 3 that's true, to, to what they've, they've, they've been used to. It's modernized, it's supported, you know. Make, that'll earn some goodwill, okay? And then I give them Free Space 3, they get all happy, I don't screw it up, you know, God willing. You know, I get some goodwill from there, and those people come back and say, hey, you know what? Hey, that crazy guy who did Free Space 3, he's got a new game coming out, that's gonna take a look. For me, even that would have been a multi-million dollar gamble, it's, I mean, we spend that much on marketing anyway. That was the thing. So somehow, I don't know how it got out. As is expected, a bunch of people were like, don't let him get his hands on it. You know, this is the people who have no idea how the system works. You know, there isn't a single IP on this planet you couldn't back up a truck with money in and not get it. Okay, right now, the only thing preventing me from getting a free space license to do free space three is a schedule to what terms we can agree on. That's it. One of the really interesting things about this two part series is that while researching it, I'm able to see the shifts in Derek's attitude and mentality over time. You have to remember, his legacy is decades long and still ongoing. You also get to see his unique ability he has at downplaying his part. Derek was pretty good at playing victim in his early days. But by the mid-2000s, after the failure of Battlecruiser and the lackluster reception of Universal Combat, Derek changed. He lost that love and excitement he originally had, and he started to build resentment for the gaming industry. It's also important to note around this time that there was a strange stigma that started to develop around Derek. Each game he creates, even really to this day, can easily be looked at as a spiritual successor to his prior game, almost like he's continuously making the same game over and over again, just with new tech and a facelift. Derek's released a lot of games, but they're all basically the same thing. Enormous, empty space games in a shared universe with mediocre combat and overly complicated interface with heavy micromanagement. So every project he attempts to get involved in is met with this disdain because it comes with this underlying fear that he has ulterior motives, like somehow, some way, Derek will suck all the resources out of whatever project he's working with just to help him reach his goal of creating the perfect Battlecruiser successor. There's almost a certain level of tragedy to Derek's origin story, because in the end he's human. He can be a complete dick, but he's human, and he's always been the underdog in situations, so it kind of makes you want to root for him in a twisted kind of way, or just stand there in awe at the amount of controversy he can produce. But to his credit, he does have a certain level of experience. You have to give Derek that. He knows the game industry in and out. He's been in it for many years. He's been on all sides of it, from consumer to developer to publisher all the way back again. He's failed miserably, faced a lot of resistance, and where a lot of game devs would have quit, he did soldier on, and he learned from some of his mistakes and has improved. 
Over the years, he has developed a small niche audience that enjoys his style of space simulators and the scope he's trying to achieve with them. And in turn, he's loyal to them and wants to do them right. So with Lionel Defense, I wanted to get away from that. You know, I don't want them getting mad at me because they are my bread and butter and I'm very, very, very uh, loyal to the guys who buy my game. So I figured from the word go, we're going to put a, a compelling space environment. We're going to build the, uh, the entire game around that, but it's really not a space game. But people who like space combat, they have the space area to go to. They have the stations in space. You have carriers. You can go in them. You can fight in them. You can run around them. You can fly around. It's there. So that way I keep my install base happy and while attracting uh, new, new gamers who will probably like this kind of game. Think about it. A lot of people would have just washed their hands at game development if they would have went through Derek's Battlecruiser release and Take Two fiasco. Not him. He sued Take Two, won back control of his IP, and he spent years trying to fix the mistake that was left behind by both parties. Take Two didn't give a shit about fixing Battlecruiser for the buyers. Derek did. And he wanted to right that wrong for people who did support him. But that's all lost in the chaos he created outside of the game. The barrier that really stops him from any mainstream success ultimately comes down to Derek himself. He's his own worst enemy. The extent of his stubbornness, defensive nature, and the inability to properly accept any form of criticism from consumers or peers online has literally tainted his name over the years and left him with this glass ceiling where any talent or potential he could have in the future as a game developer is lost and will never be achieved the way he envisions it. No publisher wants to touch him due to his history of lawsuits. Hardly anyone wants to work with him because he's a potential PR nightmare. And most importantly, he can't outrun his online reputation because his ego causes him to have this endless compulsion to defend himself and attack others, thus reinforcing any preconceived notions people may have about him and at the same time solidifying that same online presence he claims to be running from. This is the Derek Smart cycle. But alas, all cycles must eventually end. In part two, we're going to cover the rest of Derek's legacy. From his rise from internet laughing stock to gaming's anti-hero and all the flame wars in between. And hopefully by the end, we will be able to shed some light on what might actually be motivating this 30 year long saga of the desktop commander. Is it the obsessive need to finally create the game he's always imagined? Is it the need to redeem himself and finally be able to leave the gaming industry satisfied? Or is it something else? Something more simple. Something more raw. Now, Derek, are you jealous? of Chris Roberts? Well, again, let me ask, the, 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 I think the precursor to that question would be, what is there to be jealous of? I'll give you an example. I'm a, I'm a happily married man. I have a loving wife, I got a loving daughter. I got a whole bunch of fans who pay my bills, they buy my games, they, they, they follow me around, they've been with me since day one, the guys who I will absolutely not compromise anything for that's why i don't make games for anybody else but them okay plus i don't have 500,000 people looking up to me for a game they've given me 120 million dollars for now here's the thing which jealous person hears sees that an old you know industry colleague come back after over a decade pan you know pan in hand saying hey i want to make my dream game that i couldn't get to make give me money which jealous person goes out and says, okay, here, how much? And then goes and pledges for, yeah, for one of the, the, the high tiers. Yeah, I mean, you how does that make any for. fucking sense? 